Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the second part of the set of lectures focused on crystallographic directions and planes within crystal structures. So the first part talked about directions, now we're gonna focus on planes. And just a little sidebar, right now Super Bowl 53 is going on and between the New England Patriots and the Los Angeles Rams. So by the time you watch this, the game will likely be over um, hope whatever team you're rooting for won. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. So, with regards to crystallographic planes, now we're going from talking about one dimension, which are your lines, to do two directions, which are your planes. So you see some similarities between what we we're talking about now and what we talked about before, but there's this, there's more complexity because now we're going along two dimensions. So our crystallographic planes are represented by Miller indices, similar to what we did for our direction. So we have you know, our Cartesian um, axis, we're gonna be dealing with um, a unit cell, a cubic unit cell specifically, but you see your planes are along um, two directions, all right? And so it says on here that your indices are reciprocals of the axial intercepts. So basically in this particular, um, set of slides rather than just you know reading off the numbers and then you know dividing and all that we're going to actually take intercepts um in some of these calculations which you will see and what you know there is that this is one set of so this particular plane here with your origin here your x y and z axis this is a zero zero one plane and if this were a cubic sorry this were a unit cell not actually a cubic because you can see that these are not straight lines this plane is parallel to this one above it and also parallel to this one below it and they will all be equivalent. Uh, similarly here what you see is that now we have a 110 plane and these three are all equivalent uh, 110 planes and this is these are equivalent 111 planes. And what you notice is that as I have more and more indices that are non-zero, uh, my shape kind of changes or the way my, um, my planes look change. And you're going to see the reason for that as we go through this um, set of slides. Okay, so we have our plane within our unit cell. Let's figure out how we determine the numerical descriptors of those planes. And so this is a blue plane here. We have our cubic unit cell with our A, right, our B and C lattice constants along the X, Y, and Z axes respectively. And again, you will notice that here, our origin is here, as would typically be the case. So the first thing we want to do is figure out, we look at our plane, and we want to know if, first of all, does this plane intersect the origin? We notice that this plane does not. It doesn't cross or pass through the origin at all because the origin is at this location, and the plane intercepts here, 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 and here. So corners are not the origin of the unit cell which is good. The other thing we'll notice is that if I look at this box, right, I see that it intercepts the X and Y axes, okay? So it intercepts multiple axes, right? Two of them to be specific. And so what I do is when I'm looking at my origin, I want to make sure that my origin also, the origin that I choose is going to maximize the number of places where this plane crosses the axis as well. So it may not make sense right now, but when we do some examples, you see, so this one's more, it's pretty easy. What I can just look at is say, does it cross the origin? No, it does not. So let's move on from there. So that's the first part. So because it does not cross the origin, we don't need to reposition it. So our origin is going to remain at that particular location. The next thing we're gonna do is read off the intercepts of the plane in terms of A, B, and C, like we did for vectors. All right. So if we're over here, all right, we see that this plane crosses the x-axis at this portion of our unit cell. So it crosses the x-axis at a value of 1 for your a. And then we notice that from this origin, it crosses the y-axis, right, at 1. Okay, so it crosses the x-axis at 1. It crosses the y-axis at 1, but we notice that it never crosses the z-axis, but I go all the way up and continue, or I go all the way down and continue. So when it does not cross a certain axis, we will say that the intercept there is infinity, in the sense that it never intercepts or never crosses that particular 
um, axis. So it's not zero, it's just infinity. So our values, our intercepts are one, one, and infinity. So our intercepts one, 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 and infinity, as you see there. So the next step, so we've done part two, step two. The next step is to take the reciprocals of each of these values. So one over one, one over one, and one over infinity. Okay, when we do that, our values become one, one, and zero. Then the next step, like we did for our vectors, is to reduce so we get all integers. And if you notice here, oh, all integers are the slowest possible integers as well. So if you look at this, these are all simplified one, one, zero, and there's nothing we can divide by, so we don't need to reduce. And the last thing we do is we enclose in parentheses. And so our Miller indices for this plane are one, one, zero. So two things to note, the difference between our crystallographic planes and our crystallographic directions are the first of all, in the directions we don't do reciprocals, but in the planes we take reciprocals. So that's the first part. The second thing is that we enclose our final indices in parentheses while for our directions we do square brackets. Something important to note, that is how we tell the difference between whether a set of numbers refers to planes or if it refers to vectors. If it refers to planes, parentheses. If it refers to vectors, square brackets. Here's another instance. So this is another plane, this plane and enclosed by this um, triangle within this unit cell. Okay, and the origin is over here again because that's where all the axes originate from. So again, first step is, do we need to move this? We see that it intersects three axes. Um, based on that origin, is gonna intersect the Z the X and the Y. So the plane doesn't pass through the origin. And if I keep that position as my origin, I cross at the maximum three points that I want from what I can see in this diagram. So I do not need to move the origin. Then we read off the intercepts. All right, so if I look at this for the X axis, I will say that this here is right about halfway. Okay, so my intercept for the X will be about one half. And then if I go in this, and that's positive. If I go in this direction, my intercept is one because it crosses at the full length of the unit cell. And if I go in this direction, which is Z, it crosses at three quarters. I mean, for some, it might look like two thirds. So if you wrote two thirds there, um, based on what you see, that would be perfectly fine again, but this is three quarters. So this is one half, this is one, and this is three quarters. And those are our intercepts. So one half, one, and three quarters. And again, the next step, take the reciprocal of these intercepts. So one over one half, one over one, and one over three quarters. And when we do that, we're going to get two, one, and four thirds. So I have these two as integers, and I have this fraction. So what do I need to do here? I need to get rid of this fraction by multiplying all of this by three. So I'm gonna multiply two by three, one by three and four over three by three. When I do that, I get six, three and four. Again, we multiply it by three because that will get rid of this fraction. So six, three and four. And last step, and close in parentheses. And my Miller indices for these plane for this particular plane is six, three, four. All right. So those are some examples to explain it. So now we're going to do some some complex exercises, and this will be a moment when you can look at this, all right? Um, what I'll do is I'll do the first one. I'm going to do A uh, because, again, it looks very different from what you've seen. I'm going to do A and I'm going to do B, but all I'd encourage you to do is look at A and follow through as I do it and then try to do B on your own. So we look at A, all right? And remember, the first step we're trying to take is we need to figure out if we need to reposition the origin. So we have our x, our y, and z, and our origin currently will be in this position. Okay. Now when I look at this triangle, okay, and because it's a triangle, and typically with all these planes, if you see a triangle, you like to, to um, cross, you'll be crossing three axes. If you see a, um, a square or a rectangle, you're either crossing two or one. And so I see that this particular Triangle crosses three of my axes. It crosses the Z, it crosses here, it crosses, or, or rather, let's simplify it this way, it crosses three sides or three edges of my unit cell. 
if I kept my origin at this location, I will only be able to find one intercept. You notice that I don't see an intercept along X for A, and I don't see an intercept along Y for A. So even though this particular plane does not cross the origin, it does not maximize or allow me to maximize the number of intercepts I can find. Because the goal, again, is to move around this, move my origin such that I maximize the number of intercepts I get. So let's try. We know that this box has eight corners. So we have eight options to move our um, origin around. Okay. So if we move over here, if our origin is here, this origin does not allow me to cross um, does that allow that, that plane to intercept any of this side? So that's a bad origin. If I move my origin over here, my plane doesn't, my A plane doesn't cross Z, it doesn't cross Y, it doesn't cross X, so that's pointless. This is also pointless. I move here, I don't cross at all, so that's pointless. I move here, and for that, I don't cross here, I don't cross here on the Z or the X, but I cross on the Y, but I only cross one. So again, I'm back to what I did here. Um, which was, there's no point moving it over here, I get the same thing. If I move it here, I cross the X, I don't cross the Y, and I don't cross the Z for that particular plane. So my only option really is to put my origin here. My origin has to be located here because if my origin is over here, then I'm going to maximize the number of intercepts I get. Because at this location, if this is my, where my axis originate from, I'm going to cross the Z, I'm going to cross the Y, and I'm going to cross the X. Or better put, I intercept the Z, I intercept the Y, and I intercept the X based on this plane. So that's where my origin has to be. So therefore, I'm going to put my origin in that location. And I'm going to make a note here, say, the plane does not cross the maximum number of axes if I were to put it here, on my based on my original origin, so I have to move it, and I'm going to move it over here. And so that's where my origin is located, denoted by that zero. So now I can move on to the next step. So I just showed you that because, again, in the other examples, I did not have to move them at all. But that's the exercise you have to try to go through to figure out what your new origin should be. All right, so the next step is to figure out my intercepts. So my x-intercept, denoted by that blue dot, is going to be some value, right, which is going to be and from this is my origin, so this is one third and it's positive one third. So I have positive one third here. Okay, so then I put, I note my y intercept, which is that blue dot, and you see that that is positive one half. And then my z intercept is this, the red dot, and you notice that to, for me to, if my origin is here, this red dot is not one half, it's actually negative one half because the look from here. To here is in the negative z direction so that's going to give me negative one half so these are my intercepts all right and then the next step is to take the reciprocals of those so one over one third one over one half and one over negative one half when i do that i get three two and negative two then i figure out if i need to reduce right to get them all to integers or to get them to be simpler numbers and i don't need to because i can't divide this by anything to retain integers and so my indices would be parentheses 3, 2, and 2 over bar. Okay, so that, those are the million indices for plane A. All right, what I would suggest here is, again, take a moment, look at plane B, and try to work it out in your head before I go through it. All right, so you can pause, sketch this out, rewind, look at A, and try to follow the same analysis there. So I have B, okay, and let's say the B was the only one here. My origin, again, is back to the original position. And the first question I need to ask myself is, do I need to reposition the origin or not? So if my origin is here, when I look at this plane, this is a square. So your square is either going to have one single intercept or multiple intercepts. When I look at this, I see that this plane B crosses these two edges, which are both related to the Z axis, and these two edges, which are both related to the X axis. So... My plane crosses my, my um, unit cell or intercepts my unit cell in two axes. But if I were to put my origin here, I would only be able to see one of those, right? I would only be able to see the X. I would not be able to see Y or Z. So therefore, my origin cannot be here. 
I would have to move it somewhere else that maximizes that. So my option, and again, we have made a note here. If I put it here, this position does not maximize the number of axes I cross. So I'm going to move it either to this or this. Because if my origin is here, I intercept at two axes. Or if my origin is here, I intercept at two axes. So I'm going to put my origin here. So now my origin is at this point denoted by that O. And the next step is to find the intercepts. All right, so we look for intercept along the x-axis is that blue dot. And again, with respect to the origin, that blue dot is along the negative x-axis, right? Because this is positive and I have to get backwards to get that value. We'll say it's, it's one half based on this designation. So that right there is going to be negative one half for my x-intercept. All right, now for the y, we, note, we look at this point and we draw, we look along these axes, the y-axis in this direction or that direction. Now, what do we notice? We notice that this does not actually cross, right? No matter how far I draw this line, it will never intercept this plane. And because that plane does not intercept or intercept, right? Intercept or intersect. Either way, it just means it doesn't cross. So because that line doesn't cross, that plane doesn't cross the y-axis, my y-intercept is infinity. Infinity because basically what it's saying is that this plane is parallel to this axis, right? That plane is going left and right, parallel to the left and right direction. So there's nothing there. And then we look at the z, which is going up, and we see that from this origin, I have to go in the positive one-half direction to intercept um, the z-axis, therefore, my z intercept is one half, right? Noted by that red dot. So that gives me one half. And now I take the reciprocal of each of these. I'm going to get negative one, one over negative one half, one over infinity, and one over one half. That gives me negative two, zero, and two. Okay, so I see this. And can I simplify? Yes, because these are both two. I can divide through by two to get negative one, zero and one. Finally, I put those in parentheses, one over bar, zero, one. And those would be the million indices for that plane. Okay, so you're gonna see a few of these other examples um, in your homework and in your quiz and in your exam. So again, look through, the t look through the suggested textbooks or you can actually just search on Google and look for some examples that you can practice on. I'm sure, I think there's other videos on YouTube as well. Okay. So now, if we were to now be given a set of numbers and we were to go back from those numbers and try to find or sketch the index, this would be how you do it. You basically go in the reverse direction. So now we, t we have our numbers. So in the vectors, what do we do? When we got our numbers, we try to um, divide um, by a number so that the numbers were never greater than 1. In this case, once we take the reciprocal of each of the indices, that takes care of that because basically whatever number I have is always going to be less than 1 once I take, or at least maximum of 1 once I take the reciprocal. So you take the reciprocal of each index and then you sketch the unit cell and I'm going to avoid doing any um, negative unit cell. So what I'm going to show you is how to move the origin. Okay, so if you have a negative index, we're going to move the origin. So then we're going to once we know where our origin is, we're going to mark our intercepts based on that origin. Okay, so we mark our intercepts, and then we're going to join the intercepts after that. All right. Now, this is where it gets tricky. If you have three points, it's pretty easy to draw because you're just going to draw the three lines, three points, and you get a triangle. Okay? It's much harder when you have one or two points. If you have two points, you're going to have a plane that's parallel. If you have one point, you're going to have a plane that's parallel. With two points, it's going to be parallel to a line. With one point, it's going to be parallel to the axis. Okay, it's going to be parallel to a set of axes. So you're going to say it's going to be parallel to either x, y, or x, z, or y, z. So I'm going to do an example in the case of the three points and one in the case of the one point. Okay, and I'll give you one with two points to solve um, later on. Okay, so we're going to sketch a couple of planes. A 2 over bar, 1, 2, and then 0, 1, 0. I'm going to sketch both of those within the unit. So and again, we're going to use the instructions on the prior slide. All right, so what you can do here is, again, you know, um, you have this set of slides, so maybe have your slides on one side or have it printed out and then look through the slides as I go through and make notes on that. 
So we're going to try to sketch that. 2 over bar 1, 2. All right, so typically in this unit cell which we sketched, this would be where our origin is. But notice that we have a negative index, okay, and a negative x index. So because we have that, and want to avoid drawing additional unit cells, I'm just going to go ahead and move my origin, okay? And how we're going to move our origin? We're going to move it in the direction of that negative index. So we're over here, all right? And we're going to move along the x-axis due to that negative index. So I'm going to move my origin from here all the way over here, denoted by that zero. As I keep saying zero. It's denoted by that capital O. Okay, that's how the origin is. Not zero, O. Okay. So now we're going to take the reciprocal of each of these numbers. Okay. The reciprocal of um, negative two, one, and two. Okay. Because again, that's where it differs from our vectors we have to take reciprocals all right so we take the reciprocal of the x index and that gives us negative one half right one over negative two gives us negative one half we take the reciprocal of one we're left with one we take the reciprocal of two we're left with one half so we know that all of these numbers are going to be within our unit cell because they're all you know less than one right so we're good so we have these. So negative one half, one and one half. Now we're going to mark those intercepts on our unit cell. Okay? Based on where our origin is. So keep that in mind. All these intercepts are based on this location. So the first thing we do is we're going to mark out the x. Okay? So we're here as our starting point. Our x-intercept is negative one half, and so we mark out negative one half with that dot. Okay. Then again, all of these intercepts are with respect to, to the origin. So the vectors would have normally gone from, we would have marked this out and then gone a different direction. But we're taking everything relative to this. So we mark out one half with that. And then relative to here, we mark out 1 for the y-axis and positive 1. So we're going to go along here to get that. Okay. And then we mark out positive 1 half relative to the origin for the z. And so we're going to go all the way up. Stop there. Okay. So these are our three intercepts. And once we have the three intercepts, our last step is to join all of those. And we join all that and we shade it. And that's where you get this triangle from. So that's there is representative of this particular plane. All right, two over bar one, two. Okay, so again, those would be, that would be the easiest one you see because there are three intercepts. I just have to join three intercepts, okay? And when I specifically say it's the easiest, you have three full, um, you have three values for your millions, three non-zero values for your million indices. How about this situation where I have only one non-zero value? How would I solve it? Again, the steps are going to be the same. So we have zero, one, zero. Okay. Um, there are no negative indices. So I keep my origin there as that. Okay. That's my O. Take the reciprocal of each of those values. I get one over zero, one over one, one over zero. So my X would be infinity. My Y will be one my z would be infinity. And then I mark my intercepts. So when you're marking your intercepts relative to zero to O, right? So again, it never crosses the x. This infinity here means that there is no x intercept. Infinity here means there's no z intercept. But there is a y intercept, which is represented by that black dot. Okay? So that's the only intercept that I have. So now <laughs> If you look at your instructions, your instructions say, now once you do this, you join all your points. But I can't join any points because I only have one point. How would I join it? So what you want to keep in mind is that you're, you're parallel to the x axis. You're parallel to the z axis. So I'm parallel to this line. And I'm also parallel to this line, which means I'm going to be parallel to the x, z plane. Okay. So one hint you can think of is that for these cubic unit cells, anytime you have a, a 
a only one non-zero value, you're actually going to have to be one of these faces because you're parallel to a whole plane. So you're either going to be parallel to x, y, or x, z, or um, <clears throat> you're going to parallel to x, y, okay, x, z, or y, z. In this particular case, we're par parallel to x, z, and we are going to cross this particular point. And the only way that will happen is that we would have to be on this face, which is going to be given by that. Okay, so that there gives you your zero, one, zero, based on that being your origin and based on this particular set of coordinates. So what I've made a note here is that this plane is parallel to both the x and the z axis. In other words, it is parallel to the x, z plane. All right, so that one is a, it's, it's, it's hard. It's probably the hardest. It will be one of the harder ones you see, but just keep in mind that anytime you have only one non-zero index for this cubic unit cells, that means you're going to be at one of the faces, and then it's up to you to figure out which actual, which particular face you're on. Okay. So the third part of this, just like we did for the directions, is figuring out planar densities. Okay, so our linear densities were atoms on a line divided by the length of the vector. Our planar densities are atoms on the plane divided by the area of the plane. So two dimensions, so we're going to be dealing with areas. So this question says we're going to find the planar density of the 100 zero plane of iron. And notice again, like even if I didn't use the one zero, if I didn't, if I didn't use the word crystallographic plane here, I could have said find the density of one zero zero with parentheses. I want you to see that you have parentheses that tells you it's a plane. So our iron has the following crystal structure. And what is this crystal structure based on what we did in chapter earlier in chapter three? Can you think about it? What is it? It is going to be a body centered cubic. Okay, if you guess that right, that is correct. This is a body centered cubic. All right. So the one zero zero plane for the body centered cubic is one where I intercept the x axis. So this is actually going to be the face. All right. So um, I did that really quickly, but because we've talked about the um, how to find planes earlier, I would encourage you to figure out how you find that face. So this is actually representative of my one zero zero plane. Okay, so before you do this, you always want to sketch, right? So we have this sketch, and if I drew this out, you see that this is a plane that has atoms on the corners, so that would look like this. This is a one zero zero plane with the atoms present there, okay? Where one of these sides is given by the edge of our unit cell. So let's think about the top part of this. It says the number of atoms centered on the plane. If I looked at this, I'll be like, well, there's four. Okay, and then if you thought back to what we did for volumes, you say, well, these four are the corners, so it will be one eighth. But you would be wrong. Why is that? Because we're thinking of areas. So what you now want to think about in comparison to what you did for volumes or what you did for linear is how much of this, if you think of these circles as pies, how much of this pie is actually in that square? Okay. And you would say that this is a quarter of a pie, this is another quarter, this is another quarter, this is another quarter. Okay, so quarter, 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 and therefore you would have four times one fourth. So the top part of this would be that there is one atom on this plane. You're looking at the areas, you're not looking at volumes or diameters. So that's one part of this. So that takes care of the top part. The bottom part is the area of the plane. We know that this is a cubic unit cell, and therefore this side has to be a square. And that square has a side A, so my the area of this square is going to be A squared. The question, though, is what is A, right? A is this side right here. What is A given by? Well, we figure that out based on these expressions. So the first question I asked you was, what kind of unit cell is this? You said, hopefully correctly, that this is body-centered, and therefore this would be the expression that I'm interested in, which tells me that 4R is equal to the square root of 3 times the edge. Therefore, this side here, which is the edge, is going to be 4R 
over square root of 3, which if I multiply the top and the bottom by square root of 3, it looks like this. So mathematically, typically, when we do fractions, we don't keep a square root on the bottom. We multiply top and bottom by square root of 3. So this here is the same thing as saying 4r over square root of 3. It's just a mathematical uh, math mathematical semantics, okay? All right, so um, it's kind of like the Oxford comma. People have, like, preferences for this stuff. It's still the same value. So you have number of atoms on the center of the plane. We've discussed that that is one because you have four quarters. And on the bottom, the area of the plane is going to be given by a times a, which is a squared. So this is what an expression looks like. And I have r, so when we put this in full, we have that the planar density is one over a squared. And a is given by this. So I take this and I square all that. And we know what r is. If you solve this out, you will get 12.1 atoms per nanometer squared. I typically won't tell you to convert that to meters. I'm okay with you just putting it in atoms per nanometer squared. So that there is a planar density for this particular crystal structure based on that plane and based on the material we're talking about. So this will vary depending on the material, which will have different radii, and depending on the actual plane I'm referring to. All right, we're going to do another exercise. So this is the one that we used earlier for the vector, right? So you see the vector that we're discussing here. Now we're going to be talking about this particular plane. So I have this unit cell of this metallic compound, which is, again, what kind of unit cell is it? What kind of crystal structure is this? Uh, it is going to be called the body-centered crystal structure, or BCC. So that already tells me that I'm going to be interested in this. So then the question is saying that we're going to find the planar density of this plane, and your planar density is given by the number of atoms centered on the plane and the area of the plane. So we're going to sketch this out like we're looking at it from the top, and when I do that, I end up with this dimension, okay, where the sides of this particular square are going to be based on the edge, right? The, that Those are edge dimensions. So that is my square, that is my atom that was centered on it, okay? And then these sides are the edge. We've said it's body center, so that's the expression. And the atomic radius is 0.134. That is the formula for planar density. Great. So the first part is we figure out how many, not what are the number of atoms centered on the plane. Okay, the number of atoms centered on this plane is going to be because I have one full area. I have one full area of the atom within that is going to just be one, one atom. Okay, not a half because it's space, but just one. So that's one on the top. And the area of this plane, which is given by this square, is going to be edge times edge. So my expression looks like one over edge times edge. Okay. And all we have is a radius. So now I can put my radius in terms of my edge, right? This bottom part is edge squared and the edge is 4r over squared of 3. So I have my, my planar density is 1 divided by 4 over square root of 3 squared, where this is given by the edge. Okay. So again, if this was something else, if it was simple cubic or face centered, my expression would look very different. So that is my planar density, and we're told that the r is 0.134. And so my planar density, I just substitute that for r. I get this. If you do this correctly, plug it in your calculator, work out the math, you will get your planar density is equal to 10.4. All right? So this is my expression. And that will be my solution. Why does all this matter? Because the linear and planar densities are what tell us about slip, which is basically descriptive of plastic deformation. All right? And what you will start to see, and I'm going to show you guys a graphic. I don't know if when you were a kid, if you ever slid down the stairs, uh, with the carpets, um, that has some relevance to why um, density back pain will actually have pretty easy slip. Okay, so these are the overall formulas um, of these. Again, the only way you can calculate linear density or planar density is to know what the the ve vectors or the planes look like, and the only way you can do those is by figuring out how to draw them, which is what these were about. So again, overall, this is this brings us to the end of chapter three. We cover quite a bit of material in chapter three, all the way from structures of metals and structures of the ceramics on how to calculate their densities to vectors and planes.